drum beating when it's hard times when it's long days and the enemy is right up in your face when your back's against the ropes and you're feeling all alone keep fighting the good Be the voice saying you're gonna make it when you're out there on your own. You are never alone. Keep fighting the good fight. Keep letting your light shine. Cause I'm never gonna leave you. Always gonna see you through to the other side. Keep fighting the good, fighting the good, fighting the good. Keep fighting the good fight. darkness you're the fire a holy flame for all to see and in my heart you reign forever
church. Stay standing with me for a few moments as we say the Believer's Creed together. I am a believer. I believe in Almighty God the Father, the creator of all there is. I believe in Jesus Christ the Lord, God's only Son, born of a virgin womb. I believe Christ died for me, returned to life, rose to heaven, and is coming back to earth again. I believe in the Holy Spirit and his power to help me be like Christ and do his work. I believe in the Bible, God's holy word, and all his promises to me of abundant and eternal life. I believe in the church, God's forever family. I am the righteousness of God in Christ because I am washed in the blood of the Lamb, filled with his spirit, happy, holy, forgiven, and free. I am greatly blessed, highly favored, and deeply loved. I am a believer. You may be seated. If you are visiting with us this morning, we are so happy that you're here. Um, you'll find in front of you there should be a Connect card. If you'll just fill that out um, and take it back to the Welcome Center coffee bar area, we will give you a book called The Champion Life, Improving Your Way to Success. This was written by our pastor. And uh, we just, here at Revive, we want you to be able to live your best life through Jesus. And so that's our gift to you. If you will just fill out one of those visitor cards and give it back to us at the coffee bar. Thank you, Danielle. It's great to be in God's place, God's place of worship today. Great to worship God with you. Just want to remind you that we have services every Wednesday, 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. God is meeting us in the morning at 11 or 7. Join us for one or both of those services. It's offering time. God bless you, brothers and sisters, if you'll come down. We'll receive this morning's tithes and offerings. I remind you that we are taking a trip to Israel in January. You will not find a more economical trip, $2,577, if you pay for it by October, I believe it is. We're going to have a supernatural time in a very, very special place on this planet during strategic times. Join us if you can. Talk to us about the arrangements that need to be made. Are you ready to give to the Lord? Let's pray over your gift this morning. Father, we bless you and thank you for every opportunity we have to sow into the kingdom of heaven, to sow into good ground, Lord, to sow into a church that ministers the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Minister to our needs as well, Lord, our homes and our hearts and our bills, our careers and our businesses, Lord. We ask for promotion. We ask for anointing, direction, we ask for supernatural prosperity as we place you first, and we thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. We've had just an amazing week in our family. Our five children are only home with us 
um, once or twice a year. It may happen again this Christmas, but not all the in-laws, I call them in-loves, but not all the in-loves were home this week, but all five of our children were home for a few days uh, to celebrate. Zach and Preston being with us, our second son, and our grandson Preston is with us this morning. Would you welcome them? Let them know. Greet them later. Zach is an amazing man. He was trained to kill for several years, and he fought in Afghanistan. Think of this. That's the truth. And now he's trained to save lives. Praise the Lord. He's a pararescue um, in the Canadian Air Force. And uh, pray right now. Pray right now for those uh, individuals that are still trapped in the cave in Thailand. I've heard that at least six of them may have been rescued already. And what Zach does, his job right now, if that happened in Canada, he would be one of the divers going in to rescue. Pray for him. He's always doing something dangerous, something that requires more levels of adrenaline that, than most of us have. But he's one of my personal heroes, my son, Zach. Great to have you with us today, buddy. Pray for um, that situation in Thailand. I heard that they may have be waiting another day now to go in uh, for, to rescue more of those boys. But uh, we pray. And thank God for the sacrifice that was made by one of those divers that died during that rescue attempt. We want to pray for Jan Persons today as well. She was taken to the hospital early this morning with some heart problems. She needs the help and the grace of God. Let's take another moment as well to pray for the U.S. Supreme Court decision that will be made this week. We need God. This will affect America for generations. So we need to pray. Would you stand with me? Father God, we come before you. All these needs are before us, but we know that you're greater than any mountain. You're greater than any impossibility. You're greater than any difficulty. Your arm is not shortened that it cannot save. So, Father, for unspoken requests here today, for needs in our own hearts and burdens, we place them before you. For these boys in Thailand that need continued rescuing, for Jan Persons, Lord, for this U.S. Supreme Court decision that will be made to appoint another judge. We pray that righteousness will prevail. We pray that truth and morality will be held to the highest standard, that you'll bless this nation as America blesses God. May you bless this nation. We thank you for it. And now, Father, we put all the other cares and concerns aside because we want to see your face this morning. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We want, Lord God, your hand to reach down from heaven and touch us in a deep and lasting way. So receive our praise this morning, Lord. Receive our worship, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name.
take me out How could I be lost when you have called me found You chase me down You seek me out How could I be lost when you have called me found You chase me down You seek me out How could Yeah. 
to tremble at the light that you bring when you walk into the room. Every heart starts burning, and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. We worship you.
for everything that you mean to us, Lord God. I know sometimes we may take this for granted, Lord Jesus, and forgive us if we do, God, because you are so amazing and you're worth everything that we could ever worship you. Just We couldn't worship you enough, Lord God. It could never end. Lord, I put my hands up today, not in taking it for granted, Lord God, but I put my hands up and surrender, Lord Jesus. I surrender all of my thoughts and all of my hopes and all my dreams to you this morning. This morning, Lord God. And I just pray that you would just touch us in a new way, Lord Jesus. And if you want this for your life today, just throw your hands up and surrender for these next few minutes. Just surrender everything that you have. Throw it as a sign as I, I'm not holding on to anything anymore. I don't want to be held back. I just want to see God. So if you would, just throw your hands up and surrender. whisper his name, Jesus. Jesus, sweet Jesus. Precious Jesus. Yeshua, Savior, Lord, Master, God. King of kings and Lord of lords. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Isn't it sweet just to rest in his presence, just to worship him because he alone is worthy. Why don't you put your hands together and give God the greatest round of praise. praise. Give Jesus a round of applause. He is wonderful. He's counselor. He's mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace. Glory be to Jesus. You may be seated in God's presence. Thank you, Pastor Megan, helping us to worship God in a very rich way again. This morning, I was thinking several times around the table as all five of our kids were home for a few days, as I said, that doesn't happen very often anymore. But the joy of a father around the table with all five of the kids home in the same place, laughing at the same silly games, what we were playing, Mad Gab and um, Balderdash, um, just having a riot and laughing till our sides hurt, it made me think of the father's heart, how he is. Anxious for the day when we'll all be home around his table. Can you imagine? And we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. And the blessing in our home makes me want to pray that same blessing in your home. If you need restoration, recovery, rebuilding, God can do that and he is up to that task. Can you say amen? What do we say every Sunday morning here, here at Revive? What are we doing for the next few moments? We are loving the word and we are learning the word so that we can live the word. A scripture to jump off of this morning is this. 
Joshua 1, verse 3. God says to Joshua, Every place your footsteps I have given you. Look at that carefully. Every place your foot is going to step, I've already given you. Somebody's going to catch this. Every place your foot is going to step, I have already given you. What does that tell some of us? If you want more territory, you better be moving. Hello? If you want more in God, you better not be standing still. You better be walking with God, going to where he wants you to be in God. Every place, every place, every place, your footsteps I've already given to you. Pray with me now. Father, we're opening your word today because we want our hearts and our spirits to be touched and challenged and changed and brought more into line, more into alignment into greater obedience with your perfect will for our lives. So speak to us in these next moments, and we'll thank you for it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. This morning, the power of place. Where are you? The power of place. Exactly where are you? It's good to know where you are. It's good to know where things belong. You've all heard that expression. A place for everything and everything in its place. If you're in a a woman's kitchen, you better put it back where it belongs, right? Everything's got a place and everything should belong in that place. What is a place? A place is a location where something or someone belongs. A place is a location where something happens. Right? A place is a location where memories are made. You know, even the Bible starts in a place. Human history starts in a place called the Garden of Eden. You, you started in a place. One of the first things that people want to know about you is hey, where were you born? Because you come from some place. You started in a place. Our lives are marked by places. I can remember the place. I could take you there today. A park bench where I was sitting, the place where I first laid eyes on that beautiful woman, Valerie. I can remember the place. Very special place. I can remember where I first kissed her. It was on her left cheek, right about there. No, I mean, I mean the place. I can remember the office that I, I reached to kiss her for the first time, and she demurely and shyly turned her face, so I got her right there. <laughs> I can remember the church aisle that she walked down on and the place where we met and she became my wife. Now, I normally live between a, a, a romantic scale of 0 to 10. I normally live around an 11 Right now, I'm living at about a 15 because in two weeks from today, we'll be married 35 years. Hallelujah. So we're not going to miss a Sunday over this, but July 22nd, we'll be married 35 years. And uh, in between the Sundays, next Sunday afternoon, we're taking off for Florida for a few days of, of uh, a blessed time, a few days of sunshine because we're not getting enough sunshine around here, right? <laughs> Places are special. Niagara Falls, Canada is special to me. Pastored there for 20 years, and all five of our children were born there, so it's filled with memories, right? Collinsville, this region, this church, this place has become so special to me. I can remember the place. I'm pointing it out to you right now, right over there, just to the right, well, Doug's right, our left. You're right about, exactly, thank you, Doug. Right there, several years ago, where God sealed my love for this place and this region, and God marked me with an unshakable love for you and this church, and God said, you're here, and you're supposed to be here. It was during a little bit of a rough patch, 
when I needed to know, and God met me right there. You probably still feel some of that right, right there, don't you? Places matter. The city of Courtney, British Columbia, and Vancouver Island, a very important place to me because my son lives there with his wife Ripley and my grandson. That's an important place to me. Tulsa, Oklahoma, where three of our five children are married and living, that's an important place to me. There's a house that my dad built, and I used to say I helped him build, but really I held the end of the board as he cut it, you know, that kind of help. A house on a high hill surrounded by farms and ranches in New Brunswick, Canada, where I grew up, that's an important place to me. And about three miles from there, further in the country, a little country church, I could take you to the place at the altar where I met with God time and time again. Drive two and a half hours southeast of there into Nova Scotia to a Pentecostal campground in Truro, Nova Scotia, the place where I, as a young teen, felt the call of God in my life to minister for him. Places are important. I ask you this morning, are there places, are there mile markers in your spiritual journey you can point back to and say, that's an important place. Places are important. The Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit back near the turn of the century. Places mattered. Cleveland, Tennessee. Topeka, Kansas. Azusa Street, Los Angeles. Places where God met his people. You know that our eternal life will be spent in a place called heaven? It's amazing when you study Revelation. The Bible says that the great white throne judgment, when all the nations and all the people of the world will stand before God, the Bible says in Revelation 20, catch this, the Bible says that all heaven and earth will flee, try to hide from the presence of God and his judgment. But there will be no place found for them. Isn't it an amazing indictment of the judgment of God that there's no place found for the rebellious and the unrighteous? Not just no place to hide, not just no place to run, but no place kind of important to have a place, isn't it? Well, places are important all throughout the Bible. Mount Sinai, the law was given in that place. God said there, this is how you serve me. This is how you worship me. This is the law of how you approach me. This is what you must do. This is what you shall not do. A place where God's word and God's Torah and God's law was given. Bethel, Bethel, a place where Jacob met with God and he saw a ladder coming from earth to heaven and the heavenly father standing at the top and angels descending and ascending. He said, this is a place I've got to remember. I'm going to call it Bethel, the house of God. Places matter. The Jordan River places. God said time and time again, Old Testament, New Testament, build a monument. Erect an altar here. Remember this place. Remember this moment. Remember what happened here. Remember what you learned here. Remember how your life changed from this place. So I ask you again, do you have places that mark your spiritual journey? Do you have places that are holy? Mount Horeb. Bible says that Moses was on the back side of the desert. Now it's one thing to be in the desert. It's another thing to be in the middle of the desert. But it's a whole other thing to be in the back side of the desert. In other words, to get out of this desert, you're going to have to get all the way back through the whole desert again. So he was in a very dark, dry, blank, empty space. 
But I want to tell you, if you're in that place, that's precisely where God can show up. Because there in Mount Horeb, God met Moses in a burning bush. And what did God say to Moses? Take your shoes off. Because the place you're standing is holy ground. You don't even want to have sandals on in this holy place. Are there places in your life where you felt so close to God, you said this is holy ground? The Bible says taste and see that the Lord is good. You need to experience God. You need to feel God. You need to know God is here now with me. And this is a holy place. You need those experiences. Gethsemane, a place in Scripture where Jesus wept, where Jesus sweat great drops of blood. His perspiration came out as blood out of the pores of his body. He was wrestling with his divine commission, the place where he said, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup of suffering and abandonment and rejection from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That happened in a place under olive trees. Gethsemane means a place of the pressing. And it was a spiritual place where Christ was pressed so heavily that his sweat became blood. Gethsemane, a place. Golgotha, the place of the skull. The side of a mountain that literally looked like the face of a skull. A place where God's judgment met his love and, and, and wrath and mercy kissed on Mount Golgotha, an important place. That place is so important that we mark the years of eventuality and time and history from what happened there. Jerusalem, a place. The empty tomb, a place place where God had the final word over your sin and over death and hell and the grave. Places. I encourage you to come with me to these places in January. It's going to be a powerful time as we stand in those places that have marked our lives. Can you say amen? But spiritually this morning, spiritually, what place are you in? Where are you? What is your spiritual GPS? I'm not talking about global positioning system. I'm talking about God's placement settled. God's placement settled. See, for the Christian, you should be settled in your place. You should know who you are. You should know where you are. You should know this place you're in. You should know God's perfect settlement for your life. You know what's one of the hardest phases of our life? It's transition, isn't it? I'm not sure where I should be. I know I'm moving. I know I'm going somewhere. Where am I going to end up? What's happening? This change, transition is difficult for us. Not knowing where your place is is tough. It's hard. You need a church home, don't you? You need to know that you belong, that you're valuable, that you matter. And think of it this way. If you don't have a regular place that you show up, how will people know if you're not showing up? <laughs> That's a little logic for us, isn't it? Sometimes we're in the middle of blessing and we don't even know it. Sometimes we're surrounded by our need and we can't even see it. I love the story of the uh, ship that was sunk in the Atlantic Ocean and several of the sailors climbed into their lifeboat and they were far from land. They couldn't see land and they had used up all the water resources and ate up all the, the preserves that they had stocked in the lifeboat. And, and it was days now and they were, they, were, they were desperate. They were dying. They couldn't drink the salt water out of the ocean. They knew that would kill them. They didn't know what to do. They were desperate. They were dying within hours of dying. And one man... 
dipped his hand in the ocean water and splashed it over his face, trying to cool down, and he realized, wait a minute, that's not salt water. He took some and he tasted it. It's fresh water. He started drinking it. Guys, guys. And they said, you're delirious. You can't drink the salt water. It'll kill you. He said, try some. He splashed it on them. He realized suddenly they were not in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. They were in the broad mouth of the Amazon River that was flowing out hundreds and millions of gallons of fresh water. They were sitting, swimming on life and didn't know it. How many Christians think that they're surrounded by the enemy, think that they're going down for the last time, think that there's no hope, and they're actually swimming in the ocean of God's presence and mercy, and all they've got to do is dip out and say, with joy I will draw water from the wells of my salvation. I'm going to live and not die. I'm going to be blessed and not cursed. I'm going to go, go out with glory, not, not defeat. So where are you? What place are you in? I've asked you already several times, do you have mile markers that you can go back to? Can you say in that place, God met me there? And if you can't or have spent so long, I'd encourage you to say, hey, maybe I need a new place. Maybe I need a new meeting time. Maybe I need a fresh experience with God. Maybe I need to realize that that my lifeboat is not sinking on the seas of a salt water of destruction, but I am buoyed up by the mercies and the grace and the presence of God. Let me ask you, if you're a born-again Christian, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you believe the Word of God with all of your heart, where are you this morning? Let me tell you where you are. You are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's where you are. You are seated in heavenly places places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians tells us. You're not down in the dumps. You're not in the middle of despair. You're not in the greatest desert period of your life. You are right now, the Bible says right now, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute, I thought I was sitting on a pew in Revive in Collinsville, Illinois, United States of America. Oh, yes, you are. But spiritually, God sees you, my friend, as seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So in other words, if you knew where you were right now, if you knew your placement, you would understand you're not just going to heaven, you're already in heaven now. You're not just going to have eternal life, you've got eternal life in you right now. Does anybody feel what I'm preaching? Where are you? I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are you right now at this moment? I've got a throne somewhere. It's not level with Jesus. It's not level with the Holy Spirit. It's not level with God the Father. But I'm up there seated, seating right now in the throne room of glory. What on earth do I have to worry about? Where are you? Seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why are you seated there? The next verse tells us exactly why. Why are you at this moment, God sees you seated in majesty, seated in glory, seated in heavenly authority, in a heavenly place. Why? So that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches uh, and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. That's why you're seated there now, because God's got a plan in tomorrow and the day after that and the year after that and on into eternity and on into history to show his kindness and grace towards you in Jesus Christ. Oh, if we we'll realize where we're seated, if we we'll realize where the authority comes from, our identity comes from, where are you from? I was born in Parsville, Nova Scotia, but right now I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are you from? Well, I was born in Troy. I was born in, in Edwardsville. I was born in Maryville. I was born in St. Louis. But right now I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, the difference in authority of a Christian who thinks they're going to heaven and another Christian who says, I'm already seated in heavenly places. Somebody say, I'm going to get this before we leave. I am seated right now. So you're not down in the dumps. You're not in a pit of despair. You're not in a den of iniquity. 
You are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And what does the Bible tells us? tell us? We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, right? We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Now, in those two things, what's God's responsibility and what's ours? The blood of the Lamb, who did that? Did we do that? No, Jesus did that, right? The blood, that's already taken care of. The blood satisfied God's justice. The blood satisfied God's anger. The blood was sufficient to pay the penalty for my sin and yours. Somebody say, praise God for the blood. So we overcome the enemy by what God did and by what we say, which agrees with what God did. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So we better get in our mouths what God says about us. Where are you from? <laughs> I'm from the right, I'm, I'm from the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where I'm seated. That's my address. Oh, bless God. Anybody going to heaven? Anybody living there now? Oh, bless God. Somebody say, I am born again by the blood of Jesus. See, when, when you have this assurance, when you have this knowledge, when you have this awareness, there's no fear anymore. The disciples forgot who was in the boat with them, right? didn't they? They got in the boat. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. You guys row and put the sail up, and I'm going to go in the back and sleep. They forgot who was in the boat with them, and they forgot what he said to them. And when we get upset, when we get frustrated, when we get depressed, when we get filled with anger or anxiety or fear, it's because we forgot who's in the boat with us and we forgot what he said to us. We forgot his promise. So they're in the boat, they're rowing, they're putting the sail up, they've done this a hundred times before, but suddenly a vicious storm comes up and suddenly they're full of fear, right? Master, don't you care that we're dying here? Wake up. They're shaking Jesus. Jesus gets up and reminds them that they have such little faith and he says, peace, be still. Had they remembered who was in the boat and what he told them, he said, we're going to the other side, they might have had a little different attitude, right? I've got to remember, you've got to remember, when God gives you a word, he's going to make it come to pass. When God gives you a promise, when God gives you a prophecy, when God says he's going to fill this church, when God says he's going to use this ministry to impact this, this, this region and this nation for his glory, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Somebody say amen. When God says he's going to save your children, he's going to redeem them, he's going to bring them back to the foot of the cross, you've got to say, God, I believe it, that settles it, and that's enough for me. I believe your promise, God. Because I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are you? I mean, where are you? Where are you positionally? You are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Number two, where are you? You are in Christ and Christ is in you. You are in Christ and Christ is... Where are you? I'm in Christ. Devil... Take your best shot. You've got to go through Jesus. I'm in Christ. Can the devil bother you? Can the devil make you sweat? Can the devil make you lose your joy if you're in Christ? Where, do we know where we are? We're in Christ, and Christ is in you. If you are in Christ, the Bible says, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. That old lifestyle, that old way of thinking, that old, those, old, those old habits... That, that, that old self-preservation, that old pride, it's gone. It's not there anymore. I'm a new creation because I'm in Christ. Galatians 2, 20 says, it is no longer I that lives. It's not even me that's living this life, but Christ who lives in me. Anybody ever find out that living the Christian life is just too difficult for this flesh? Mm -hmm. Hello? <laughs> it's just too hard for miles. I can't do it. I can't be that sweet and kind. I can't be that forgiving. But Christ lives in me. His word becomes my word. His attitude becomes, his mind becomes my mind. His love becomes my love. When I was over there just 
go back where you were. When I was right there <laughs> several years ago, I was saying, God, I can't do this. And God said, good, let me through you. And now he's doing it through me. Somebody say glory to God. You were in Christ. Where are you? I'm in Christ. If you begin to answer the accusations of where are you? I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. And Christ is in me, the hope of glory. And Christ isn't going anywhere, and neither am I. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Where are you? I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm seated. I'm uh, trying to remember which girl it was, one of Zach's little sisters, but I preached this message years ago, a message like it in Niagara Falls, and I had one of the girls at two or three years of age, and I put a seat on the stage, and I said, now, sit there while I preach. And I used her as an image of what we do. I said, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you know what she did? She got off the chair and wandered away, right? And I put her back on, and I said, I want you to see this, that you are right now, you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Stay there, honey. And a few moments later, she was off wandering someplace else, picking a guitar string or something. And it was a perfect illustration of what we do. God says here, sit here in heavenly places. Well, no, I, I think I'll go down here in my depression chamber for a while. I think I'll go over here in my, my, my self-pity uh, room for a while. I think, I'll, I think I'll live in my depression den for a while. I think I'll live in my, in my, in my pride kitchen for a while. I think, I, I think I, no, Jesus said, sit, sit there. We're not a dog, but he can say sit to us. Be seated in heavenly places. You know, when you're seated in heavenly places, your attitude changes. Mm -hmm. You begin to see people through Jesus' eyes. You begin to feel for people like Jesus feels. When you're seated in heavenly places, you look over and you say, oh, Jesus is weeping over this world. I better weep over this world too. Jesus cares for the lost and the hurting I better care for the lost and the hurting too. So where are you? Seated in the heavenly places. Where are you? You're in Christ, and Christ is in you. And finally, where are you? You are standing in the true grace of God. That's what the Bible says. 1 Peter 5, verse 12. You are standing in the true grace of God. Interesting to me that that Bible verse says the true grace of God. Obviously, there must be a fake grace of God. There must be a false grace of God. There must be an, an, a, a, a counterfeit grace of God. We see it all around us, don't we? People that say, it doesn't matter what you do, God loves you. It doesn't matter what you believe, God loves you. God, God doesn't matter if you're a Hindu Christian or a Buddhist Christian or a Muslim Christian or if you're a half a Christian. It doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter if you go to church. It doesn't matter if you worship God. It doesn't matter what God loves everybody. It's all good. It's all grace, right? Wrong. You've got to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You've got to believe and repent. You've got to walk with God by his grace. He's got to be the most important thing in your whole world. And if you do all that, then my Bible says you are standing in the true grace of God. Oh, bless the Lord. What an image. Where are you? I'm standing in the true grace of God. Devil, you can't get me here. Fear, you can't touch me here. Poverty, you can't get me here. Because grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace means I've got more. I, I've got everything that I don't deserve. God's blessings, God's goodness, God's charisma, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the blessing of the Word of God, the blessing of the family of God, the blessing of the church. I just posted this morning, it was something stirring within me on social media. I said, you know, we better love what Jesus loves. And Jesus loves his bride, so I can't wait to get to church and hang out with his bride. Can you say amen? I'm standing. Where are you? 
standing in the true grace of God. In your biggest battle, you are standing in the true grace of God. In the biggest struggle of your life, you are standing in the true grace of God. What that means is you don't have to reach or stretch or prove anything <coughs> or make God come to you somehow. God, show up. Please, God, why don't you see me? Why don't you feel what I'm going through? You are right now standing in the true grace of God. And you know how I know that? Because if you weren't, you wouldn't still be standing. If you weren't, you wouldn't still be standing. But you're standing. You're wounded. You're bloodied. You're, you're beat up a little bit. But you're standing in the true grace of God. John Newton wrote it years ago, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved, and precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. Why are you standing? Because you're standing in the true grace of God. Where are you? What's your place? Standing in the true grace of God. Where are you? I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. Where are you? I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But I close with one of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible. Because it tells us that God has not forgotten the last, the least, and the lost. It tells us that when you're forsaken and forgotten and neglected, God still has a place for you. When you're lost and alone, a foreigner and the forgotten, God still says, I've got a place for you. The outcast, the neglected, the overlooked, the forgotten, those that are passed over and ignored, God has a place. Isaiah 5 says, even to them, who? The previous verses, you can read about it, the neglected, the forgotten, the overlooked, the foreigners, the outcasts, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name. Whew. Better than that of sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. I think that verse in the Bible is for somebody watching on the internet today or somebody in this place that says, oh, all that great preaching, all that's good stuff, but not me. I'm the overlooked. I'm the neglected. I'm the forgotten. It's been too long and I've wandered too far away from the place God called me to. God says, even to them, somebody ought to praise God with me right now, even to them, the farthest from me, the most rebellious, the most outcast, the forgotten, even to them, I will give them a place and a name in my house. never be cut off. And why can Jesus do this? Because he took our place on the cross. That's why he's got a place for you around his table. That's why he welcomes the outcast, the forgotten, the neglected, the lost, the least, the last, the foreigner. He says, I've got a place and a name for you in my house and on my walls. At my table and on my walls, there'll be a peg with your name on it to hang your coat and your hat. There's a place for you. Do you know your place in the kingdom? Do you know where you are in Christ? Do you know your authority? Do you know your identity in Jesus? Do you have a place where you can meet with God? Do you have a marker in your life where something was settled between you and God and your life was never the same? I'm offering you a place today. This altar is a wonderful place to meet with God, to 
have people pray with you, anoint you with oil, and speak the word of God over your life. Someone's going to find a place this morning. Can you say amen? Father, we bow before you in your holy presence. We thank you for your word. Thank you for a calling to find a place in your kingdom, to find a place of belonging, a place of memory, a place of anointing, a place where we can mark it and say, God met me there. And Lord, we pray for every heart in this place. If there's anybody who's not right with you, anybody not walking with you, anybody not serving you, anyone needing to make a fresh declaration of their life to serve Jesus. Don't let them leave this place, Lord, before saying yes to Jesus. Would you stand with me just quietly in God's presence?